Well, amen. We're just going to jump right into things today. I am super, super excited. So uh, we have launched something called Kingdom Builders. It's our, we, we want to make sure our eyes are focused outside of these four walls. We don't want to just be stuck to what God is doing here, but we want to partner with missionaries and ministries throughout the world to make a bigger impact for God's kingdom. And so we thought instead of just having different ministries and missionaries that we're supporting through Kingdom Builders uh, and sharing that with you, that throughout the year we want to have some of these uh, people that we support to come into the house and share what God is doing so we can hear it with our own ears and our own heart. And so I am super, super excited to have Brent Silkey here, who is running 30 for Freedom. So he's going to come on up and he's going to share an awesome message with you. And let's give him one more round of applause. Woo! Glad you're here, bud. Thank you so much, Pastor. When I walked in this morning, I was greeted with smiling, friendly faces. And the closer we got to the beginning of service, it just felt like family in the lobby. And then to worship together was so powerful. This is my first time here. So this is my first time experience with this community of faith. And I just want to take a moment and say thank you to Pastor Justin and Pastor Tara. Thank you for, for following God obediently and making this place possible for all of us to just come and worship together and be a family of faith. Let's give it up for our pastors. So powerful. Again, my name is Brent Silkey. And I wanted to introduce my family to you. They couldn't be here in person today, but this is my family. My wife and Elizabeth and I, um, this June, will celebrate 15 years being married, and God has given us just a gift in these four kiddos, um, Belle, Clara Jean, Henry, we call him Hank the Tank, <laughs> and Josiah, and those are our four kiddos. Um, currently, our 10, 7, 4, and 1, it's birthday month for the girls, so that will change soon, but uh, 10, 7, 4, and 1, and we have the great joy and privilege of serving as missionaries. And I think a lot of times you think of missionaries, you think overseas, and we have a lot of amazing missionaries out of Minnesota that go overseas and serve God. Uh, we actually serve the next generation as missionaries. And so we serve on the college campus at the University of St. Thomas, and we serve in a ministry called Chi Alpha. And our whole purpose and vision and mission in Chi Alpha is to help college students in the next generation find Jesus and follow him for a lifetime. What does that look like? What does that mean? We get to do that every week. So we kicked off our spring semester on Wednesday this last week, and we prayed with seven students who said, hey, I want to put my faith in Jesus, or I want to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. And it's just like, think of the community you guys have here at this church extended onto a college campus. And so we've been doing that for the last eight years. We've been Chi Alpha missionaries serving at Saint, in St. Saint Paul at the University of St. Thomas. So that's what we do full time. And uh, we also have the joy of serving um, a ministry called 30 for Freedom. And I promise you, I will explain more than just showing you a logo with a 30 and an X by it. Uh, I will sh we'll share more about that in a moment. But I wanted to give you the main idea of where we're going today as we read God's word. There is something that happens when we move from comfortable to less comfortable, right? There's something that happens in the kingdom of God when we move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of other people. And I think about what Jesus did. I think about leaving the perfection and the glory of heaven to come to the brokenness of the world, leaving comfortable to, come, to be less comfortable so he would go and literally die on the cross in our place. How uncomfortable that would be. And then he gave us an opportunity to have new life and to follow him and to find what does it mean to, to have the fullness and, and the trueness of life in Christ. And I'm going to share a story with you that happened at a camp a few, a few summers ago. We were in a sanctuary that was full. I think there were probably 600 students of the next generation worshiping God, praising God. It was just this amazing thing. And there are moments where you can walk into a place and you can like tangibly feel and experience the presence of God. And you could walk into that camp and you could walk into the sanctuary and just like, be like, wow, God, you are doing a work. You are doing a dynamic thing in this generation. And, and my tradition actually isn't to be up front <laughs> where all the, all the craziness and the jumping is, is happening. I'm, I'm in the back, and I'm usually pacing and praying and singing. And I noticed something when I was in the back of that sanctuary. I noticed a young lady who was sitting down. Nothing wrong with sitting down. But it was, it was a little bit out of place. And I remember, I remember walking closer to her, and I recognized that she seemed to be in distress, and so I came up to her, and I was one of the camp counselors, and I just said, hey, is, is everything okay? And I could just tell she was having a hard time, like, hard time breathing. And, and so I said, do you happen to ha do you have asthma? And she nodded her head. And I said, do you have an inhaler on the campground? And she nodded her head. I said, you probably don't have it in here, do you? And she shook her head. 
So I, I learned where she was staying. I grabbed one of the other counselors. I said, hey, we need to get to that building. We need to get to that room, and we need to find this girl's inhaler. So we sprinted across the camp to the building where she, her room was, into her, the room where they were. Everyone was in the sanctuary. So we went in, and we look around, and there's bags and purses and backpacks everywhere, like millions upon millions of bags. I'm like, God, help us. Help us find this inhaler. So it, we've somehow miraculously found this inhaler. My counselor friend ran it out to me. I, it was like a 4 by 100 re- relay. I was in track in high school. And it was just, I like, like got, the, got the hand off, and it ran into the sanctuary and I found this girl who now had the two camp nurses there, and they had some friends around her. And I remember running and sprinting through the doors, comfortable to less comfortable, and handing her the inhaler. And I'll never forget the sound. I tremble in her voice. And she could breathe. It was a crazy few minutes. And I remember, I remember the relief that came upon her face when she had what she needed. And I think about this idea of moving from comfortable to less comfortable today. And it, it sometimes is dramatic like that, like they actually need oxygen. And sometimes it's, it's the church hearing about something that's happening in the world, saying we cannot say, we have to do something. We have to do something about this. We have to move from our place, wherever we are, comfortable as we may or may not feel, to less comfortable so that somebody else can experience what they need. And as we jump into this message today, I just wanted to share a story that happened to me when I was in college at North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I came into chapel one day, 19-year-old kid, blonde hair I think I had at the time. Long story, we don't need to go there today. Uh, And I remember sitting in the upper balcony of the chapel because I was late that day. And I sat in my seat, but I was completely unprepared for what God was going to do. A man came to the platform like this. And he began to share story after story after story about these little girls, these young girls in India, and what they had experienced by being trafficked. And I understand there's some young girls in the room, so I'm going to change a few few of the things that I'll share. But the things that that I heard made me squirm in my seat as a 19-year-old kid. And I thought, dear Jesus, something has to happen. Something must be done. And I knew that that morning I could give in the offering, I knew, as a kid who was working part-time at Best Buy, saving up for an engagement ring, (laughs) I knew I could give that morning in the offering. I knew I could pray, but I felt like God was saying, Brent, I'm calling you to do something more. I'm calling you to go from comfortable to less comfortable in a much greater way than you could ever understand. I'm going to leave you hanging for a moment. We're going to pause that story. I will come back to it, I promise. But I I want us to look today at an incredible account we have a physician, a doctor, who, took these, who, who, who documented the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the birth and the explosion of the church in the first century. His name is Luke. And in Luke's gospel, which we're going to be in this morning, if you have your Bibles or if you have your Bible app, I would encourage you to check out Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. And what we're going to look at today is what, what happens when a group of people move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of somebody else. We're going to look at today an example of when four people said something must be done for our friend. And to set the context for what's happening here, Jesus of Nazareth, a carpenter, right, carpenter's son, is there and and he's at this house. But he's not just this carpenter's son. He is this miracle-working guy. He has come on the scene. He's about 30-some years old, young 30s. And he's this guy that everyone's heard about He is opening the ears of the deaf. He is opening the eyes of the blind. He is literally, he's casting demons out of people who have been in bondage, spiritual bondage. He is allowing people who have never walked before to walk. And if you can imagine someone like that being present on the earth in your town, right? There would be crowds around them, crowds around them all the time, wherever they went. And then he was someone who taught, and not just someone who taught like one of the religious people of the day, but he is someone who taught as with authority. He is someone who taught, and he didn't just proclaim the kingdom of God. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, and he demonstrated the power of the kingdom of God. And so you have Jesus, this carpenter's son, and he's in this house. And if you can imagine, these houses were not large. He's in this small house. And there are people all around him. Now, in the crowd, there are religious people. There are Pharisees. There are people who are, who are skeptics. There are people who are there that are like, 
I'm just kind of here for the show. I just want to see if he's going to do a miracle today. I want to see if he's going to heal somebody today. And I just want to have a front row seat in this house. There are people who are there who are desperate for a touch of heaven, who are desperately in need, who are in this house. And I think about how hot it would have been. (laughs) How hot would that have been to be packed standing room only in this little house in the middle of the day? And we find out that it's not just packed inside the house, but the surrounding area around the house. There's just people everywhere. There's hordes of people. They just want to be by Jesus. And there are four friends, and they, they recognize the plight of their friend who's paralyzed is that they, their friend cannot work. Their friend cannot hold a job. So the only way this friend can have food and provision is if this friend is carried from where he lives to a place where people could maybe give him money or give him a handout. And so they're like, this, there, there's, there must be something more we can do. Jesus is here, the carpenter's son, this miracle-working guy is here. Maybe we could bring our friend from where he is to Jesus. So they get him, and I don't know if you've ever carried somebody before or, or taken care of someone before, but to carry somebody who had, does not have strength in their legs all the way from wherever he lived to this house that's packed full of people and everything around there is surrounded by people, they saw the crowd and thankfully they didn't just go home. But they said, we have to do something more. And not only did they push their way through this crowd outside the house, but they got their friend on the roof. If you've heard the story, you know where I'm going with this. If you haven't heard this, this is crazy. They begin to dig through the roof. And if, I don't know if you've ever been in a place, Pastor Justin, if you've been preaching anywhere, and all of a sudden, like, something, like, there's some kind of distraction noise, and it's like, huh, someone's coming down. Right? All of a sudden there's digging sounds and there's scraping sounds and all of a sudden there's a hole and there's a light that's poking through the roof, through the ceiling. They're like, what in the world? And I don't know if Jesus continued to speak and he just projected his voice louder or if everyone stopped and looked up at the hole that was beginning to become larger and larger in the ceiling. And then all of a sudden there's an, there's an eclipse, a human eclipse. As a body is being lowered, this man who is paralyzed through this hole in the ceiling. And if you can imagine, I I put myself sometimes in the position of the people that we read about in the accounts of Scripture. What would it have felt like to spend your whole life asking for help, asking for help, asking for help, not able to hold the job, not able to work? And now you're being lowered down by these four amazing friends who move from comfortable to less comfortable on your behalf to get you before Jesus, this miracle-working God. And you're being lowered on this mat, probably not perfectly steadily, in front of a house full of people, standing room only, hot, sweaty, and you're being lowered down in front of Jesus. I would be, I would feel very self-conscious. I would feel very like, oh, I hope this works. And Jesus looks at this paralyzed man who's been lowered on a mat through the ceiling from his four friends who move from comfortable to less comfortable on his behalf. And he says words that are amazing, but probably not what he was looking for. Jesus looks at the man And he says, your sins are forgiven. Awesome. That is awesome. That's good news (laughs) to have your sins forgiven. But he's probably laying there like, and? Uh, I can't get up and get out of here. Could you do, you know what I mean? Like he's probably, if it's me, I'm like, fantastic. My sins are forgiven. Come on. And Jesus, it says this, the Pharisees and the religious people who were there We're thinking these thoughts. How could he say that? How could he blaspheme the name of God and forgive someone? Say he forgives someone's sins. He's putting himself on the same level as God. They thought these thoughts. And then Jesus addresses them. How scary would that be? (laughs) If you're a critical religious person and you're in the room, you're like, oh, I can't believe him. You're thinking this. And all of a sudden, Jesus speaks right to what what you're thinking. He said, some of you, yeah, you're probably like balking at this whole thing that I said he's forgiven. But what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and you're healed? And Jesus looks at the man and he tells him to get up on his feet. This paralyzed man. He gets up on his feet. He takes his mat and he walks out in full view of them all. Can you imagine being someone in the crowd that day? Being someone that just came to listen or, or maybe you came and just, oh, I just want to see something. Like is Jesus going to do some kind of miraculous work? Or maybe you're a Pharisee like, oh, he, he can't believe he said that. And then he gets up. And he rolls up his mat and he walks out in full view of them all. Jesus is saying, hey, I don't just have the authority to say that I forgive sins. I have the authority of the kingdom of heaven. I, your sins are forgiven. But just so if there's any haters or any doubters in the crowd, get up and walk. 
and he performs this miraculous sign. And it wasn't this thing that happened in a back room in a corner somewhere in the dark at night. Full view of every person in the house, the entire crowd around the house. And Jesus healed and forgave this man, and he walked out changed. His life was forever changed. His soul was forever changed. His body was changed. And I think about what happens, church, when we as a church decide that we're going to make it a lifestyle action to live from, to move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of other people. And maybe you're one of the amazing people who serves in this church family. And you're a greeter or you're an usher or you're helping on the tech team or you're helping with the kids or the youth or whatever, you, you're, the, the worship. You are moving from comfortable to less comfortable because, y'all, I know what it's like to try to pack up a bunch of kids in the minivan and get them to church on a Sunday, right? It, it's, it's really moving from comfortable at home to less comfortable to come and be a part of community. But there's something so powerful about that. There's something about so powerful when we say, hey, this ain't about me. This life that God has given me, this time on this earth, this ain't about me, it's about Jesus. It's about moving from comfortable to less comfortable so that more people can know about Jesus, so that people can be free. So I told you I'd come back to the story. I got wrecked in that chapel. If you fast forward from there, 10 years. I'm 29 years old. It's December 28th, 2015. I'm sitting at a Perkins of all restaurants. (laughs) Praise God. I was sitting at Perkins. I was with one of my former youth students. I used to be a youth pastor. He graduated from our youth ministry. He became a United States Marine. He was home on leave. And we got together for breakfast. I always love getting together with our alumni when they're home. And we sat across the table from each other. He said, Brent, hey, what's new, man? And you might know his grandpa. His grandpa's a Hall of Fame a Minnesota twin legend, Tony Oliva. It's Tony Oliva's grandson, Yoel. We're sitting at Perkins. He's like, hey, Brent, what's new? I'm like, Yoel, I am turning 30 in five months from today. And he goes, woo, you are getting up there, my friend. (laughs) And I was like, and you're paying for breakfast, my friend. And I remember I said, you know, the crazy thing is that God's put this wild dream in my heart that on my 30th birthday, May 28th, this happens to be a Saturday, that I'm on my 30th birthday supposed to run 30 miles. I'm supposed to invite 30 friends to run with me. And each raise $1,000 so we can raise $30,000 to rescue people out of the nightmare of sex trafficking. Because every 30 seconds, someone becomes a victim. 30th birthday, 30 miles, 30 friends, 30,000, because every 30 seconds. And Yoel, without hesitating, reaches in his pocket. He pulls out a $100 bill, puts it on the table. And he says the following words to me. He says, Brent, I hear briefings in the Marines about trafficking all over the place. It's everywhere. We have to do something to end it. And he slides the $100 bill across the table. Yoel, financially, moved from comfortable to less comfortable that day. Yoel also put me on a hard spot because he now put his money where my mouth was. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So I spent the next five months calling texting, direct messaging, emailing, Facebook messages. I mean, any, anything I could think of to reach out to people that I thought might run with me 30 miles. And the thing that was so miraculous is that every person said the same thing. I'm like, hey, would you come and run 30 miles with me on my 30th birthday? It's a Saturday. It's great. It's Memorial Weekend. Every person said the same response. No. <laughs> 30 miles? Is it a marathon? 26.22 miles? Why would I run 30 miles? And then I would tell them the heartbeat of and why. Why would we, would we move from comfortable to less comfortable on a birthday? Why would we do that? Because every 30 seconds, someone becomes a victim of human trafficking. The average age of a trafficking victim, 12 to 13 years old. The average age of a boy, little boy who's trafficked, 9 to 12. Something must be done. And I'll never, ever forget what God did on that birthday. Not because it was my birthday, but because of what happened next. There's a picture of a group of people who showed up on my 30th birthday. 48 people ran 30 miles. 75 from little kids that were being pushed in strollers to grandparents did a 5K for freedom. And the thing that we saw is we saw God on display that when we move from comfortable to less comfortable, he breaks all of heaven open. And we didn't just see $30,000 come in that day. When we were tallying the funds and looking online, we saw $81,346 raised in one day so people could be free in Jesus' name. 
When the church moves from comfortable to less comfortable, we are living like Jesus. When we move from comfortable to less comfortable so people can be free, we are doing the things that Jesus would do. And church, here's the thing that's so wild. Because I'm a full-time Kyle for missionary. That is my job. I am passionate to see the next generation follow Jesus. And I believe that God has called our family to serve the students at the University of St. Thomas in this way. And when we have this thing, like I hear in this chapel, that there are things happening around the world and here in Minnesota and in our backyard, like something has to be done. We have to move from comfortable to less comfortable so people can be free, so that students can know Jesus, so that trafficking victims can be free, and so that people who have been rescued survivors can be ministered to. And we have, I just want to um, share a testimony with you about this. In the last seven years, we went from one chapter of 30 for Freedom to now we have six chapters that happen in Minnesota. We have three that happen in Iowa. We have some that happen in Wisconsin. We've had people, we've had thousands upon thousands of people in the last seven years that have said, I'll move from comfortable to less comfortable. I'll run a 5K. Some people, raise your hand in this room if you hate running. The thought of running, you're like, no, sir. No, sir. You're the perfect candidate. (laughs) For real. Some people have done a 5K for freedom. Some people have done a 10K for freedom. Some people have done a half marathon, which is 13.1 miles for freedom. Some people, a lot of people, more than you would think, have done 30 miles for freedom. And we have seen God do unbelievable things in the last seven years. I have a friend who, who told me, he called me. I remember exactly where I was when he called me. He said, Brent, he said, God spoke to me. I hate running. He's like, I just want you to know. And I don't really like you very much right now, Brent. Uh, he's like, I heard the vision of 30 for freedom, and God spoke to me. I'm supposed to run 30 miles. I hate running, Brent. I can't even explain how much I hate. I, I hate running so much that everyone in my life knows how much I hate running. I'm like, oh, okay. Sounds like you might need some. Never mind. So... <laughs> He said, and I, I felt like God challenged me to also personally raise $30,000. I was like, whoa. I was like, I think I misheard you. What, can you say that again? He's like, God told me that I'm supposed to raise $30,000, and whatever I don't raise, I'm, my wife and I are supposed to give the difference. So if we raise 20, then my wife and I are supposed to give 10. Now, that's, that's moving from comfortable to less comfortable, right? So he came on 30 for Freedom a couple years ago, ran his 30 miles, he was so uncomfortable when he was done. But the thing that was crazy is that he personally raised $40,000 so people could be free in Jesus' name. Unbelievable. And what we've seen over the last seven years is not only thousands of people participate in running, but raise $1.56 million so people could be free. It's a God thing. Like, that's, like it's, there's only, that's the only explanation I have. And the thing that's really cool that I want to share with you this morning is that 30 for Freedom is a 100% volunteer-led movement. That none of us on the board take anything from the funds that are given. We give 100% of every donation directly to the cause, directly to our front lines partners. And people sometimes when I share at a church, they say, well, what kind of organizations do you give to? Like, what do they do? And it's on the screen, I believe. They do three things. Sex trafficking prevention. If we can prevent a kid or a person from experiencing the nightmare of what that all entails, and again, I won't go into it because of the young ears in the room, that's the best case scenario if we can pr- protect that from happening at all. Second, secondly, they do rescue operations. We don't have time this morning right now, but I'd be willing to stay after church if you want to hear a story of a survivor, somebody who was rescued, a 15-year-old girl from Las Vegas. I have a story I could share with you. What does it mean to have a rescue operations team go in and rescue people out of human trafficking? It's crazy. It's dangerous. We fund organizations that do that. And the final thing is survivor care. Because once you're physically safe, there's a lot of work. There is a lot of trauma that you've experienced. And to help walk people through that, the organizations we support do all three of those things. It's really important for us as from the board for you to know that we don't take any of the donations, not a percentage. We literally give everything directly to our partners. And it's such a privilege to just invite awesome churches like Connection Point, to invite churches and to invite students and invite college kids from all over this area to say, would you join us in moving from comfortable to less comfortable so they can be free? Last month, in January of 2023, there was a brothel in a village from one of our, where one of our partners serves, completely closed down. There is no, they are no longer allowed to, to sell people and to do that kind of thing there. It matters what we do when we move from comfortable to less comfortable. And again, like I said, I'd be willing to stay after and share stories with you about people who've been rescued. But I just want to, I'll, I'll just close with this before I invite Pastor to come back up. When we move from comfortable to less comfortable on behalf of others, 
and we live like Jesus, this is what can happen. In 2020, in the midst and the height of the pandemic, there was a young lady from the Twin Cities, and she got mixed up with some not good guys. They were trying to take her to a different part of the country to traffic her. A ministry leader was made aware of the situation and stepped in and actually adopted this young teenage girl into their family. And I I remember hearing this story the day before one of our 30 for Freedom events. And this dad, he said, hey, do you have any extra T-shirts? And I said, we've ordered over 1,000 shirts. I said, I'm not sure if we do, actually, because we have a lot of people running, but what are you you thinking? And he told me the story. And he said, because my adopted daughter was rescued, we rescued her from the from being trafficked, and she's going to be here tomorrow, and she's going to move from comfortable to less comfortable so other girls can be free. And I was like, yeah, we're going to get her a shirt. (laughs) Well, she can have my shirt, you know. And so I just want you to know that when we do this together as a church, lives are changed. People are rescued. People are set free in the name of Jesus. And one of the most beautiful things from my heart as a dad and a pastor is that that there are so many people who are rescued who go to these places, these safe houses, these hostels, where they're not only being ministered to and, and being fed nutritious meals and you know, being, uh, having safe housing and things like that, but they're hearing the message of Jesus Christ. They're hearing the message of the gospel that will change their life. And like Jesus, he spoke to the heart, and then he ministered to the physical. And sometimes in those situations, they're, they're ministered to the physical, and then their heart is spoken to as they have an opportunity to find Jesus. So I just want to invite all of you uh, to think about May 27th, 2023. It's our Twin Cities chapter that's taking place. And we are inviting people from all over the state of Minnesota to come and be a part of 30 for Freedom 2023. Our goal this year is ambitious. My, I was talking to one of, our, one of our leaders. He said, well, what's your goal for next year, 2023? I said, half a million dollars. He's like, well, buddy, you better step up your, your own, like, personal goal and mileage. So I've challenged some of the youth pastors in Minnesota. I said, I'm going to do a 100K, which is 62 miles, and personally try to raise $5,000 for this because we have to move from comfortable to less comfortable. As a missionary, right, like I, I have to be like really careful with, with the way that we do some of these types of things. But I'm like, this, I don't know what more important work there could be than rescuing people and helping them find freedom in Christ and then to find Jesus, the hope of Christ. So I'm just inviting you, church, consider a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon, a 30-mile run. Maybe you're like, I've got young kids. Like, how could I do this? One of my favorite things to see at 30 for Freedom Day is the stroller brigade. (laughs) We have so many young families and these young kids, sometimes they don't even realize what they're a part of, but they're, they're learning as the next generation to be a part of freedom in Jesus' name. And some people say, I physically am unable to to be a part of it. Sometimes moving from comfortable to less comfortable is physical, like running or walking. Sometimes it's through generosity. And I'm not taking an offering today, but I'm just saying sometimes that has been one of the coolest things. When someone, when a young person from a church says, hey, I'm going to try to run a half marathon. And mom and dad are sweating, and they have a goal of like $1,000. And the church says, hey, you raise $500, we'll give $500. Or like just different things that we've seen over the years. It's been really, really cool. So I'm inviting the church, to move from comfortable to less comfortable so they can be free. Let's give it up for Pastor Justin as he comes. Come on up. Put this back. Awesome. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. We're going to go into a time of worship. I have four takeaways that I just kind of wrote down. Uh, You can know how my brain works sometimes. Uh, One was, at the very beginning, he mentioned family. And I was like, yes. If you think of, like, culture that we're going for, it's we're a family. I'd rather someone not want to be a part of Connection Point because they don't want to be a part of the family than walk into church and not feel like they're welcomed. And so I was... If anything we're striving for, I was like, the culture, it's working. (laughs) It's what we're going for. The second thing I wrote down, which I just thought was funny, is I I was like, I'll never have hair like Brent. (laughs) 
because he's growing hair where I'm losing it. And so I was like, man, I could just never do that. I can never pull that off one day. I told you that's how my brain works sometimes. The third thing I wrote down, which I still think is kind of funny too, is think outside the box. I was like, I don't know if this is God or not, but I wonder if I could eat 30 wings for Jesus. So let's try that. (laughs) I have to pray about that one, but we'll see if that's me or God. And the last one was the take home of how can I move from less comfortable or how can I move from comfortable to less comfortable? And I don't know what the Lord may be speaking to you. But that's why we kind of go into worship sometimes at the end to ask them, what are you saying? If there's one thing I think is so important for us to realize is comfort is the enemy of growth. We don't want to be comfortable. We do want to be comfortable. It's what we strive for. We pay extra money. We do all these things to be comfortable. But to have the mindset, I want to be less comfortable. I want to move from comfort to less comfort. And then I wrote this down. The only time on I will ever have that I can move from comfortable to less comfortable is my time here on earth. Because when I'm up there in heaven, I'm going to be worshiping Jesus. I'm going to be in his presence. I'm going to be comfortable. But the only shot that I have for all of eternity to move from comfort to less comfort, to see people's lives change, is right now my time on earth. And so don't make my time on earth about comfort. Make it about less comfort. Make it about how can I make the biggest impact or the difference for the kingdom of God. Because when I get up there, it's going to be comfortable. It's going to be the temperature I want. It's going to be the bed, the bed that I want. It's going to be the food that I want. There's going to be no aches, no pains, no sickness, no death, no, no tired, no nothing. Like when I'm up there, it's going to be comfortable. So my one shot I have here on earth. How do I make it where I make the biggest impact that I can for the kingdom? We're not taking a special offering uh, today. What we've asked you to do is to give to kingdom builders. And we're going to disperse that through all of our kingdom builders partners. If you specifically want to give to 30 for freedom, mark that on there. We'll make sure every dollar given will go exactly to that fund out of all of our kingdom builders. Um, But that's just kind of what we felt like going into 2023. We want to up our eyes outside of this wall to make a bigger impact. We want to move from comfort as a church and what we're hoping and praying for to be less comfortable, believing God that will use us in bigger ways. So you can flip the middle light off as we go into this time of worship. Lord, we're just going to take a few minutes. We're going to worship you. Here we are. Here we are. We want to worship you. And Lord, whatever you speak, whatever you say, that's what we want to do. So it's not, not what does Brent, not what does Justin say, but what do you say? What are you speaking to us? What are you putting into our hearts? What do you want us to do? Maybe for us, just a moving from comfort to less comfortable is inviting someone to church. Maybe it's helping someone out. Maybe it is giving. Maybe there's something, but what is it that your spirit is speaking to us? So God, we invite you here. We take the next few minutes. We worship you. Let our ears be open. Let our heart be soft. In Jesus' name.